Yep, my bad. We're in 1 Peter, and uh, this might be the last week of 1 Peter on Sunday morning. We might switch back to John next week. I haven't quite decided that yet, but it'll be soon, probably next week, if not a week or two after that. But probably by Easter Sunday for sure, by Resurrection Sunday for sure. Here in 1 Peter, uh, Peter is writing this letter to a group of people who are struggling uh, as foreigners, as strangers in the world, They're facing persecution, they're being set apart in society, uh, ostracism, whatever. Uh, They're going through a hard time. And and that's because of their faith. So Peter encourages them to press on in the midst of this hardship. And, And as they do that, they need to avoid being conformed to this world. We saw that uh just in this chapter, and we saw it in chapter one too, to avoid being conformed to this world and to be holy. They need to love their brothers during suffering, and they need to long for the word of God. Now, we're saved through the truth of the word of God. It's through the word of God that we've been born again. Christ Uh, as we saw last week, is the precious cornerstone. Because of him, we have everlasting life. Because of him, uh, we have undergone this great reversal of fortunes. It's going to get unpacked in today's passage, which we're just looking at two two verses today. Just two verses. So that doesn't mean it's going to be a really super short message because we're going to unpack those verses. There's a lot in them. In Christ, we who have placed our faith, who have trusted in the work of Christ on the cross, for everlasting life. We who have placed our faith in Christ, in him we have a new identity and a new position with God. And we see that right here in verse 9. We have a new identity and a new position with God. But you are, let me just go ahead and we're going to focus on verse 9 here. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. And we'll just stop right there. That's, that's the part that I want to focus on for now, just this section. So you'll see there the first, the first term, we are a chosen race. Now, actually, before we even go there, you'll see this word, but, which is, Paul is, he's expressing this word of contrast. There's this great contrast between those who, in verse 8, you could even see they stumbled because they were disobedient to the word. And to this doom, they were also appointed. They, if you remember, they considered Christ, who is the chief cornerstone, they considered him to be worthless. Remember how we talked about the wood? And if you ever go to Home Depot and you're looking for, like, let's say, a two by four, and, you know, I don't really know what's a good piece of wood, really, but, uh, you know, people who know these things, they'd pick up a piece of wood and they'd look and make sure it's straight and they'd look for big, huge holes in it. And they would maybe consider that piece of wood worthless and throw it back on the pile and grab something else. That's what people do with Christ. They consider him to be worthless. They rejected the cornerstone, the, the, the chief, the most valuable stone that ever existed. They rejected it. But, and and they're doomed because of it, but you are this. You are totally different. You've accepted God's truth and obeyed it from the heart. These readers that, that Peter's writing to, they've placed their faith in the completed work of Christ on the cross. They have trusted in the Messiah of God. And so there's a big difference between those who rejected the chief cornerstone, who's precious in the sight of God, and those who have based their faith, placed their faith on him and based their lives on him. Unfortunately, though, those believers right now may not feel like they are choice and precious in the sight of God. Now, sometimes our feelings don't match truth. Sometimes we have what, what God says is true, but we feel differently than that. These believers are being uh, set apart from society. They're being persecuted. They're being chased out of their homes. And so they may not feel choice and precious in the sight of God. They were bearing shame and reproach as believers in the world. Now, I understand that that's not necessarily the case today. I understand that's not common today. First, 
we live in the Western world where Christendom is normalized. Now, notice I said Christendom and not Christianity because there's genuine Christianity and then there's other stuff that claims to be Christianity, but it does not accept the one true gospel. So Christendom, we're in a Christianized nation where Christendom is kind of normalized, but Christians don't bear reproach often in today's world because they love the world and the things that are in the world. They're not willing to be like counter-cultural. They're not willing to step out away from the world. They'd rather just blend in with the world. They'd rather compromise. They'd rather make friendship with the world, which is enmity with God, the Bible says. They embrace the world and what the world embraces. Instead of being a faithful Christian who stands out from the world, they blend in. And so no wonder, so no wonder they face no persecution. No wonder they can't identify with what Peter's readers we're going through because Peter's readers made the decision to step out in faith for Christ and to be different than the world, and they were paying the price for it on this earth. A costly price. Sometimes it was just feeling despised and rejected. Some t- anyone here ever feel rejected? I felt rejected many, many, many times. Sometimes it could have been just that they felt no place in this world. We sing songs like that. This world is not my home. That's not in our hymnal, is it? We need to sing that. And, uh, you know, maybe like snap to it. You can't clap. You're a liberal if you clap. You know what I mean? But whatever. (laughs) We're woke if we clap, you know. (laughs) Sorry. Um, You know, it may just... Be feeling like we don't have a place in this, in this world. Or, or for Peter's readers, they were literally aliens. That is, foreigners and strangers. I'm not talking about like outer space. You know, I'm talking about they were foreigners because they had been chased out of their homes. Few of us can identify with that. Forced to flee their towns because of their faith. And so to the world, they were rejected and they were despised and they were considered worthless. But to God, they were precious. To God, they are a chosen race. And that's what we are. It's language that was originally applied to the nation of Israel, which we see in Isaiah 43.20, the beasts of the field will glorify me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I have given waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people, Israel. People whom I formed for myself would declare my praise. Here in Isaiah, Isaiah, we talk about this all the time. First 39 chapters of Isaiah are all about judgment, condemnation, judgment because they forsook God. Chapters 40 through 66 are all about restoration. God will restore his people, Israel. Peter applies this term, my chosen people, to the church, to the people of God who have placed their faith in the completed work of Christ on the cross, regardless of their nationality or of their skin color or of their social status. They are a chosen race. God has chosen us based on his perfect foreknowledge. He has set his choice and love upon us. And he loves us infinitely and he knows what's best for us. But since we're part of this new race, we, this new family, Peter's readers got it. I don't know if the modern Christian gets it so much or not that every modern Christian gets it, that we need to be invested in that chosen race. We need to invest it in, be invested in the people of God. Too many people are invested in things, but those things are outside of the church. Now, this is for the believer. This is a message for Christians. Too often, the Christian today uh, is not invested in the people of God. Rather, they, they will choose their friends from the world. They will. Do I have friends outside of the local church? 
Yeah. yeah, I do. Do I have any lost friends? Yeah, I absolutely do. But my best and closest friends are in this room right now. My best friends, I don't know if every one of like my best friends is in this room right now, but basically the people from whom I draw my closest relationships are right here. I could name a whole bunch of you, but I'm not going to. Um, some old, some young. I don't need someone that has to be my I have I have friends my age in this in this room. I have friends that are old enough to be my You know that when you talk for a living, right? You're bound to say stupid things. Of a different, wiser generation, is what I was trying to say. That's what, that's what was trying to come out. When you choose your friends from the world, you, they will influence you with the world. When you choose your friendships with apostate churches, they will influence you with false doctrine. These believers, they needed to be with each other. They needed to depend on each other because the world had rejected them. They had no, they had no support group in the world. They needed to be that for each other. We are a chosen race. We are a royal priesthood. Now, a priest is a mediator between God and man. They would offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. And we could read about the Old Testament priesthood in the Law of Moses, where they would maybe sacrifice an animal on behalf of a person and this type of stuff. None of that applies today. Why is, that the, why is there no such thing as a sacrificial priesthood, a priesthood that offers sacrifices today? What's that? Christ sacrificed himself once for all, and then he sat down at the right hand of God. So there is no priesthood. Any, any, any denomination or sect or cult within Christendom that claims that there is a, a, a like they have a priest or whatever, it's a, they misunderstand the gospel. In fact, they twist the gospel to say that that priest is offering sacrifices on behalf of the people every day. Christ offered himself once for all men. So there is no priesthood in that sense. Now, Israel as a nation would ultimately be called a nation of priests. So you could see this uh, predicted back in Exodus 19, 6, uh, really in a, in, a, in a pretty important section of the Mosaic Law, right around the time of the giving of the Ten Commandments. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Over in Isaiah 61.6, later on in that comfort section again of Isaiah, but you will be called the priests of the Lord. Now this is, this is future language that's being spoken. You will be spoken of as ministers of our God. You will eat the wealth of nations and in their riches you will boast. Now again, Israel had a priesthood that would mediate between them and God. But Israel would eventually serve as a priesthood to the nations. They would be the light to the nations through which God would really present the needs for the gospel and, and through which the Messiah would come. Peter applies this, this idea of uh, the future priesthood of Israel to the church. When he says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. We are a kingdom of priests. You ever hear of the Baptist doctrine of the priesthood of the believer, right? We talk about this. Biblical authority, the autonomy of the local church, priesthood of the believer. That is, we all have access, direct access to God the Father through Jesus Christ. The priesthood of the believer. We are a royal priesthood. That is, we were, we were part of our, we were under our father, the devil. That's, we see that in John 8. You are of your father, the devil. When we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we now become part of God's family. We, we, we become royalty. He is the king. If you think like, oh, you know, what, what would it be like to be, I don't know, what are the prince's names over there in England? Prince, uh, was one of them William? One of them is William. Is that the one that's going to become the king? Which is the one that's married to the American actress? Harry. 
You know, could you imagine being part of the, uh, could you imagine being part of the royal wedding? I, I know those names. I just, you know, I'm not thinking. My mind spins on Sunday morning. You know, it just, it takes a little, a few seconds to click. Could you imagine being part of a royal, could you imagine marrying a royal and going from like, you know, whatever, nothing to being part of this royal, it's not usually what, what happens, but, you know, part of this royal rich family and all this stuff. Well, we have a million times more than that. We are part of the family of the king. We are a royal priesthood. We are set apart in service to God. We have special access through Jesus Christ. And as such, as royal priests, we mediate the gospel to the world. We tell the world about the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And this royal priesthood is to be known for holiness. You'll notice here that we're a chosen race. We're a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. And yet this is another term that was originally designed for Israel. And we see that back in Exodus 19, 6 again. Uh, no, let's go. Um, yeah, let's do that. A kingdom of priests. A holy nation. Uh, we see it again in Deuteronomy 6. Sorry. I don't have that one on here. Let's go ahead and just turn there. Deuteronomy 7, 6. Sorry. You are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be people for his own possession out of all the people who are on the face of the earth. And so these, this language was used originally for the people of Israel, but has been applied to the church. Holiness is part of the believer's life and calling. We are set apart to be holy, sanctified. Holiness and the priesthood of the believer go hand in hand. We're a royal priesthood and a holy nation. Unfortunately, that's an idea that is lost in the modern church. It really is. The modern church is built on how wild they can become. You want, to build a, you want to build a church. You find out what the world wants and you give it to them. Now, uh, I just found out last night that uh, there's, there was a three-part documentary on Hillsong Church. All right. And uh, it's being, I'm not advertised. Listen, I, I'm not saying, I, I want to I buy it. I want to buy it, but the only way that I think we can watch it is by streaming it through some streaming platform, and it's like five dollars a month. I'm pretty sure I'm going to. I'm pretty sure I'm going to buy it just to watch, just to watch this and then cancel it. All right, but um, I watched the first few minutes of of it was like a like a sneak peek on it, and basically that was their their we break all the rules. Let's. Give the world what it wants. Let's find out how we can be relevant and stay relevant. Like that is everything the world's doing, let's do it. And we'll bring in the masses and we'll give a positive message. Forget about preaching the word of God. Let's just give a positive, a motivational speech. And this church, Hillsong, which is basically just a rock concert, an emotionally manipulative rock concert, we become increasingly more worldly until it's rock star pastor who's hanging out with Justin Biebs and uh, who's his girl, whatever his girl's name is. And he's like, look at our new Jesus tattoos. Well, my exposed top is out there for everyone to see, you know, but I have this awesome new, I have this awesome new tattoo right on my, on my top of some Bible verse that has nothing to do with modesty. Hangs out with Justin Biebs and who else? Uh, Kevin Durant. And some of these guys, they, 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 they copied the model of Scientology. Scientology went after Tom Cruise. And if we could get Tom Cruise and if we could get the actors, we can influence the people. And that's what Hillsong did. They went after Justin Biebs and Kevin Durant and those, those guys right there. All right. And it became increasingly more worldly until the pastor was sleeping with other women and claiming to be some great holy man. Everybody thought he was such a holy guy. That's just a microcosm of the modern church and how ridiculous it can become. How sickening. I'm watching this show and I'm, I'm, I'm sickened by it. And my wife's like, Steve, calm down. 
calm down. I'm like, it's so, I'm just making me so mad. Like you have this, like Madison Square Garden loaded with people, like sold out for, for these false prophet heretics. But they put on a nice show and they emotionally manipulate people. I was talking to a, a member of a church that used to be a Baptist church. It is no longer one. And I said, hey, listen, uh, you know, on average, they said, how's your church doing? I said, I think we're pretty, pretty, pretty close to average, you know, pr- probably a little ahead of average as far as the response to the pandemic. The response to the pandemic is about 20, uh, on average, attendance decreased by about 25% on churches across America. I said, well, I don't think we're quite there. Well, I don't think we, we quite, it was, it was quite that high. We, we lost some people, we gained some people, you know, whatever. And they said, we've been growing like crazy. You, you've heard this. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, we just decided to break all the rules. We just decided to break all the rules and people loved it and they came. And so I said, so you decided to defy what the Bible said and your church grew. <laughs> I don't think he was the happiest. He, well, I guess when you put it in those terms, it doesn't sound so great. You know, but, well, that's exactly what happened. It's exactly what happened. You defied scripture and grew. Why? Because rebellion is what's popular in the world today. Now, listen, I'm not endorsing WWF wrestling, okay? Back in the day, I watched WWF wrestling when I was a lost kid. Maybe when I first got saved, it's, it's filth, it's filth. But um, there was a day when the good guys used to hold up the American flag, you know what I mean? And then somewhere along the line, the good guys started drinking beer and being rebels, probably like 20 some years ago. That's what's popular and that's what churches are giving people. Let's be rebels, let's defy all the rules, let's become increasingly more worldly, forget about holiness. Worship isn't about what people want. It's about what God says. And churches today ignore that. We are a royal, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And that idea has been completely lost on the modern church. And it's been lost in the modern family. It has. Again, in Peter's day, they're set apart from society. They're different. And there was a price to pay, and they paid that price. Today, most believers just would rather blend in with the world. They blend in the way the the world dresses in immodesty, listen to the same type of music, be it rap or pop or rock and roll or metal, and they call it Christian. They care about the same things that the world cares about. They make gods out of things that the world makes gods out of, things like money and careers and athletics and relationships and so on. You want to know if it's an idol in your life? Am I willing to disobey God to have this thing? Then it's an idol. Am I willing? Is, am I choosing this thing over reading the Bible? Am I choosing this thing over prayer? Am I choosing this thing over a right relationship with God in my life? Am I choosing this thing over worship? If I'm choosing it over worship, it's an idol. It's a God. It's a false God in your life, the thing that you've placed above God. But a genuine believer is part of a holy nation, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And that involves separation from the world and separation from apostasy. I don't participate in things with apostate churches or liberal churches. We got a letter today and I made a joke and she said, ooh, well, I wonder what that is. My wife sees it and she says, well, I wonder what that is. I says, it's probably an invitation to like, um, I don't know, the, the, the St. John's Apostolic, you know, Charismatic Baptist Catholic uh, you know, Lutheran Church. You know, like this, e- this e- ecumenical church is like, oh, we, we, you know, forget about doctrine. Forget about, se- forget about biblical separation. Forget about holiness. Forget about truth. Let's all to come together on just, you know, the minutia, the, 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 the smallest uh, minute thing that we can agree on, which would be just like, so let's just say the authority of the Bible. Well, if that's all it is, everyone can claim to be part of that. Even Roman Catholics claim in the authority of the Bible, although they don't see it the way we do. For us, it is our sole authority for faith and practice. For them, it's competing, a competing authority. Separation is no more. There aren't many people in this room who can remember what it was like when separation was a thing. Maybe... Brother Staley, remember when separation was a thing? Is it even existing today? Does it even exist anymore? Mr. Metcalf, 
You remember when separation, do you see separation today? Do you see biblical separation practice today? He's shaking his head no. Okay. And there may be a couple, maybe a couple other people. Biblical separation is a thing of the past. And yet it's an important doctrine based on the scripture's call to holiness. It's something that Peter already wrote about in chapter 1. And he says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be yourselves holy also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We are a people for God's own possession. And that's another term. All these terms are terms that God used about Israel. For instance, in Exodus, sorry, Back to Exodus 19. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples. My kids laugh at that when we say the peoples. They think that's funny, you know, because people is plural, right? Peoples. But, but this is like the nations, right? You shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for the earth is mine. We could see the same thing. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 20. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace from Egypt to be a people for his own possession. Over in Deuteronomy 14 and verse 2. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Now, we know that the earth belongs to the Lord and the fullness thereof. But Israel was a special possession to God. He had a special relationship with them as a nation. But that same thing, Peter says, that same thing is true of the church. And if you're part of the church, that thing is true about you. You are a people for his own possession. And this is something that the Apostle Paul wrote about. Check this out in Titus chapter 2 and verse 14. Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. We are a very special people that has been set apart by God for his purposes. In Christ, we have a new identity. We have a new identity. Now think about that for a second. Think about that in, in regards to what you once were. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were of your father, the devil, and now you have a new identity in Christ. But it's not just a new identity. It's a new purpose. Look at verse 9. Again, our verse, uh, yeah, 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. That is, you have a new identity in Christ, and you have a new purpose. So that, there's a reason why, you know, there's a result, at least. You have a new purpose. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Our new purpose is what? Someone tell me. What is our new purpose? You just say it in modern terms. Anyone? I thought I heard something over here. No. To testify, right? Proclaim his excellencies. To glorify him, right? To glorify him, to proclaim him among the nations, right? So yeah, to lift up his name. And that's consistent with what we see in other passages of scripture, like what the apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether then 
ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. We see the same thing in uh, Paul's letter to the Colossians. In Colossians 3, 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So we need to consider the glory of God, proclaiming the excellencies of his name. We don't, we don't, again, we don't love what the world loves. We love what God loves. Our new purpose is to proclaim his excellencies. We glorify the God who has called us out of darkness and into his light. So we have two prepositions here. So God has called us, he has invited us out of one thing and into another. Out of the darkness that we were naturally part of by nature or children of wrath. Into his marvelous light. And light and darkness are contrasted. Um, it's, a, it's a great contrast here. And we see that in the writings of the Apostle John as well. When Paul preached to King Agrippa, he said that his purpose was to turn people from darkness to light. He says to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to the dominion of God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Our purpose is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ who has called us out of darkness and into the light by faith. What are some ways you can do that? You know, you think about it. What are some ways you can do that? By, by giving people the gospel, right? By reaching out to people, by glorifying him and offering praises among the people of God, by worshiping him in song. We are proclaiming his excellencies, right? And so in Christ, we have a new identity as a chosen race, a royal priest, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. We have a new purpose, proclaiming his excellencies. And in Christ, we have what's alluded to at the end of verse 9 and, and explained more in verse 10. And you'll see that first word of verse 10, 4. That's an explanation of the last phrase in verse 9. Uh, what we, we have, which is explained in verse 10, we have experienced a great reversal of destinies. Verse 10 explains verse 9, or at least the last part of verse 9. It explains it. We were once not a people, but now we are a people. Verse 10, for you once were not a people, now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Does anyone know what Peter's alluding to? What book of scripture Peter is referring to? Anyone know? This is Bible trivia for 600. And that's 600, like, meaningless imaginary points. I'm not giving you anything, but it's just, if we were scaling it to 1,000, I'd say Bible trivia for 600. Some might say 800. If you read your Old Testament, you might say 400. Anyone remember? You will. What's that? Nice. Now, did you, did you look at the cross-references? You, che you cheated? Okay, so you, no, no points, no points to scramble. <laughs> you like how I call them right out, right? Like, did you cheat? Did you peek? <laughs> that's terrible. I'm terrible. I'm sorry. <laughs> but the Bible, so hey, listen, the Bible, so that's a good thing. Have your Bible open and you'll see some things, right? So uh, we were once not a people, but now we're his people. It is language that is used in the book of... Hosea, right? So let's go over to Hosea and take a look real quick. Hosea, very interesting passage, Hosea. By the way, Hosea was told to marry a prostitute, all right? Now check this out. God told some of the prophets to do some crazy things, right? Like he told, you know, Jeremiah. Was it Jeremiah or Ezekiel? I can't remember. I don't remember. Um... I think it was Ezekiel, that he would lose the thing that he treasured the most. And his wife died. That, and that was Ezekiel. That his wife died that night. 
treasure of his eyes. He told Hosea to marry a prostitute. <laughs> okay. Um, he married a prostitute and she had children of prostitution. And the third child was named, well, look at verse, verses eight and nine. When she had weaned Lo Ruhamah, and we'll come back to, to that one in a second. She conceived and gave birth to a third son, right? Which we'll see here. And the Lord said, name him, or, or yeah, the third son. And uh, the Lord said, name him Lo Amai, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Now, if, if in, in Hebrew, this is like the word no, okay? And this is the word people, am, like the am haretz, the people of the land. And this is the first person possessive pronoun, all right? So not my people. Not my people. The Lord said, name him, lo am I, not my people, for you are not my people and I am not your God. Now, most people understand this is probably not even Hosea's son. He married a woman of prostitution who may have had a son from prostitution that now Hosea's got to raise. Imagine that one. And that's a picture of Israel's adultery with the Lord. It's a picture of Israel cheating on the Lord with the false gods. And therefore, they are not his people. They were acting like the pagan nations around them, abandoned the Lord to worship idols, and they'd be sent into exile because of it. But yet, look at the restoration that Hosea speaks about in verse 10. Yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it is said to them, you are not my people, you are lo amai. It will be said to them, you are the sons of the living God. What do we see? We see a great reversal. Those who are not my people to those who are the sons of the living God. A great reversal. And that's the passage that Peter is referring to here. We see really the same idea just a couple, just in the very next chapter of Hosea, Hosea 2.23. And it's important that you understand the context of Hosea. If you really want to understand Peter, I will sow for her for myself in the land. I will also have compassion on her who had not obtained compassion. And I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. And the church is that. The church is a people that were not his people. We were once not his people, but now we are the people of God through faith in Christ. We were once people who had no mercy. Look at the end of verse 10. You had not received mercy. It's another allusion to one of Hosea's sons, the second son, which his name was Lo Ruhamah. Then she conceived again and gave birth Oh, sorry, the daughter, uh, to a daughter. And the Lord said to him, name her Loruhama, for I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel that I would ever forgive them. Again, no mercy. But I will have compassion on the house of Judah and deliver them by the Lord their God and they will, and will not deliver them by bow, sword, battle, horses, or horsemen. God was removing his mercy from the nation of Israel, not Judah. And we were a lot like that. We were people that were outside of God's covenant. We were people that were destined for hell. And now we have received God's mercy. Someone tell me what God's mercy is. What is God's mercy? In the Old Testament, sometimes you might have heard the word chesed. We would say, theologically speaking, that God's mercy is the withholding of judgment, judgment that we deserve. And so we were people who did not have the mercy. That is, judgment was not going to be withheld. And now we have received mercy, being saved by grace through faith. In Christ, we have a new identity. In Christ, we have a new purpose. In Christ, we have experienced the great reversal of destinies from 
hell to heaven, from the family of Satan to the family of God, from the world to the church. Peter's readers, they need to hear this right now. As they're being rejected, as they're being persecuted, as they're being set apart from society, as they're paying a price here on this earth because of their faith, they need to hear these words. Regardless of how society sees them or rejects them, they're part of the family of God. And if you're a genuine Christian, you should know a little bit about that rejection. You should experience a little bit when people look at you and say, that person is weird. Something weird about them. Well, of course they're going to think you're weird. They're lost. They're living for something completely different. We should understand just a taste of it. And if you don't understand just a taste of that, then you're probably, you're probably not living the way you should live. Regardless of how society sees them, they are part of the family of God. Regardless of how society treats them, Peter's readers, they have to understand that God loves them. And so they need to persevere through persecution. They need to recognize who they are in Jesus Christ. They need to set themselves apart from the world. They need to do all for the glory of God. And they need to remember what God has done for them. And all of that, that Peter wrote to those people in the first century, and churches spread around modern-day Turkey, all of that applies to us today. All of that is true for us today. The point of the message is this. May we glorify Jesus Christ. May we glorify Jesus Christ because he has taken us out of the world and made us part of his family, forever changing our destiny from hell to heaven. We have experienced a great reversal. We were once not his people, and now we are his people. May we proclaim his excellencies because of what he has done for us in our lives. I'd like to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a brief moment of invitation. No one looking around, just you, me, and God. Please respect everyone's privacy. You're here today, and you say, if I die today, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. But I'd like to be sure. Anyone in this room, I'm not sure I'm, I'm going to heaven when I die. I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not sure I'm born again. Anyone here at all, I'd like to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call out your name. I'd just like to, to, to see and pray for you privately. If I die today, I'm not 100% sure I'm going to heaven. You're in the room and you know that you're genuinely saved, but there are some things in your life that God has convicted you about. Perhaps it's things concerning holiness, separation from the world, um, whatever, I don't know. Perhaps it's the failure to proclaim his excellencies. God has spoken to you and convicted you today, and you'd like me to pray for you. Anyone in this room? I'd like you to pray for me. I see that hand. Amen. Anyone else? God has convicted me today through his word. And I'd just like you to say a private prayer for me. Anyone else? Heavenly Father, we come before you and we lift up your name. We know that you are the one true God and that you're the creator of heaven and earth. We know that you are the great God whose excellencies we must proclaim and who has taken us out of the world and placed us into your family, making us royalty with all the the rights and privileges and responsibilities of being your children. We know uh, that we are a holy nation, that we are a royal priesthood, that we are a people for your own possession. We know that you have taken us out of darkness and put us into light by faith in your Son. We know that we were once not your people, and now we are your people. We had once not received mercy, and now we have received your abundant mercy, the withholding of your judgment. We praise you and thank you for this. I pray for anyone in this room who's not saved. I pray that you would do a convicting work in their heart such that they would turn and repent and place their faith and the completed work of your son on the cross. I pray for uh, those who are believers 
and yet uh, perhaps have felt conviction and not raised their hands or for this one who has and just pray that uh, you would do a work in their lives and that you would continue to convict and that you would uh, empower them and strengthen them through your Holy Spirit who dwells within them and that all of this would happen for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we're going to close our service with a hymn. If you would take your handles and turn to 373.